Uh, good morning. My name's Caleb. If this is your first time here with us this morning, uh, I'm, I'm the pastor here. Um, and woo, yeah, thank you. Some of you are excited. Uh, and let me here be here on a part of a work release program. So, uh, no, I, I didn't didn't do anything in the last. Let's see how many. How many years away am I from the age of 17, 18 years old? So I, I'm not that quick at math. Um, obviously, I didn't study math or science. Uh, I studied, you know, theology. Um, so anyway, if you have your Bibles, open to John chapter four. Uh, we've been talking about the, just the radical nature of Jesus and just how he, you know, you know, started the first week of this series, this kind of audacious statement that... Um, when we give our life to Jesus, uh, he radically reorients our whole life. Um, he becomes the center, and everything else is just sort of centered around, you know, actually kind of comes around that. And uh, as his light overtakes our lives, it begins to cast um, a, a true light on some of those things that we have in our lives, and some of those things get to fade away, and other things get to remain. Um, but overall, he's center. Um, we talked about forgiveness. It's uh, you know part of our our life as believers is uh, to you know exercise radical forgiveness. We talked about radical generosity and how um, the gospel is this you know momentous force that when it impacts our lives, uh, it, it reframes how we look at and how we experience. Uh, all of the resources that we have and how we use those things to. Uh, for the glory of God. Um, a couple weeks ago, Dylan talked about uh, the, the radical nature of the Jesus community that uh, he uh, like invites us into a relationship with other believers. And when that happens, you know, radical things happen. And all of a sudden, like we are surrounded by these people who want nothing but uh, Jesus for our lives. Um, this week... I'm going to put all of those things together because that's like what ultimately, you know, when you start putting the components of, you know, the, the biblical narrative or the gospel narrative together and you kind of frame it through the life of a person, uh, all of those components kind of come together and they mesh into uh, a life that is the message, Right, it's not just a person doesn't just become the messenger; their life becomes the message of Jesus Christ. And what they do, and this is this is what John says in John chapter one: is that Jesus, Jesus, he uses this word called logos. There's the, this word logos when referring to uh, the person of Jesus Christ. It says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God." And he stacks this this very very you know interesting word, logos, which uh, he stacks it together and he, he basically points to the fact that Jesus is God's visible speech in the world. That it is, it is him that is the, the visible nature of God. So as the, the followers of the disciples of Jesus look at Jesus as the visible speech of God and they are impacted by the, the visible speech of God, that what happens in their lives is that their life becomes part of the visible speech of God. And as, as they live in this world and they, as they, they come and go and as they, they uh, go to work and go to school and go to the playground and do all the things that they do, that their life, their life gets the message of Jesus out. And this is, this, this, idea that the message of Jesus is, is actually being spread through each and every one of our lives uh, happens in, in very, very kind of radical ways. Um, and you kind of see this and actually has radical effects on the, the world around us as we live into this. Um, you see this in John chapter four. If you have your Bibles, you can open to John chapter four. I'm, so many people have preached John four, basically the, the bulk of, you know, Jesus' encounter, and we're going to look at the, the encounter of the, the woman that, at the well. Um, well, we're not going to look at that. Um, so many people have preached that, and they've done a great job preaching that. Uh, we're going to look at the result of that. But for those who are you know, new here and 
You know, the Bible's kind of a new thing. Uh, let me just give you the context. There's, um, Jesus one day is, you know, they're going back to, to Galilee, and instead of going the traditional route to Galilee, they decide to go all the way out of their way uh, to Samaria, and they arrive in this little town, which um, other gospels actually talk about how uh, Jesus um, went to Samaria several times, and the Samaritan towns didn't necessarily like his message, but this town liked his message. So he goes to this town, he goes to this well, he's sitting on the well, he sends his disciples in to, to buy, and while he's hanging out at the well, this woman comes up to draw water and basically has this exchange with him, or with the woman about, uh, you know, hey, why don't you give me a drink, you know, and, you know, they're like, wait, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and so there's this back and forth, and inevitably, um, Jesus offers her a drink of living water. He says, this is, this is a, there, I have living water. He says, really, if you wanted, if you knew what I had to offer, you would be asking me. And then they have this exchange about worship and, you know, husbandry and all this dynamic. And, and you know, I, I kind of feel bad for the woman at the well. Sometimes I read this passage because uh, for, for centuries, um, people have kind of been working pretty hard to like impugn her character into some certain dynamics. Um, and I, I just got to say, like when you sort of like look through this, like they're trying to say, oh, well, she's, you know, she didn't have, you know, just one husband that she had five husbands. And they sort of take that through like this lens of, oh, she's just this immoral person. Um, but biblical scholars don't necessarily point her life in the direction of some sort of, you know, harlot, uh, you know, or, or wearing some sort of scarlet letter. Um, they, there's a lot of reasons that they could be having this conversation. And one of the reasons is, um, you know, it's just injustice. It's the system. And you find this person that is, is here at the well and um, the it's not that she's had, you know, one husband, but she's had five husbands, which basically could mean she's, you know, maybe she's, she's barren. She's unable to have kids. And so therefore, uh, in that context, in that day, uh, with that would be a legal reason to issue somebody the, the divorce papers. And so, you know, she just kind of went down the line because of this problem that she's been having. Um, some of it other, could be like her husbands have died. Um, and so there's a, a law in the Old Testament that says, you know, if you uh, are the, the brother of, uh, or the brother-in-law of a spouse and their, their husband dies, then, you know, this is, you know, you're legally required to, to bring them into um, the family. You're, you're the, it's, lever, lever, anyway. Um, so there's all these laws, and so there's, there's all this. Another interesting thing is I read this, um, I think it was another scholar that said um, that Jesus' conversation about the, uh, the husbands has to do actually with uh, the idolatry of the Samaritans. And if you look at 1 Kings chapter 17, it's very interesting. Uh, what happens in 1 Kings 17 is that the, the Samaritans or the, the Jews and all these other people come back to the region of Samaria. And it says that they worshiped the Lord and they also worshiped all of these other idols. And what happened as a result of them worshiping the idols before the Lord is that they uh, had these lions that came into the camp. Have right? you ever heard of the, the lions of Savo, right? Have you ever been to the Field Museum in Chicago? There's these man-eating lions. Well, these man-eating lions existed in the Bible. And uh, so the man-eating lions came in and they were eating the people because of their idolatry. And um, so somebody said, you know what? Let's get a priest. Let's get a Levite priest to come and to oversee our worship of God. And so they had this hybrid uh, Method, uh, this this hybrid, you know, you call it Judaism, right? Where they were worshiping the Lord and they were worshiping all of these other things, and all the, ultimately it was all just idolatry. And what's interesting is that throughout the Old Testament, and this is how it relates to Jesus's language about husbandry, is that uh, throughout the Old Testament, the language of the the idols or worshiping idols actually takes on a marital language. 
And as she, so Jesus is talking like, hey, you haven't had just one husband, but you've had five husbands. You as a nation, you have five husbands. Anyway, so that's interesting. There's a lot of different takes on it, but the essence of the whole passage really is that Jesus, he offers an invitation to drink the living water that he has, and in doing so, he reorients her whole entire life away from whatever injustice or uh, idolatry or even, you know, let's just say, say there is an immoral aspect to this story. Whatever it is going on in her life, Jesus reorients her life away from all of that towards him, towards the one true God. And guess what she does? She takes a drink of his water. What she does is she decides, you know what? Maybe, maybe this guy, he is the Christ. Maybe he, he is the one. Because in context, the Samaritans, you know, they were, they were you call them semi-half-Jews. They, they, were, they were like uh, people in, you could call them like people in the United States that like, oh yeah, they know the message of Jesus, but uh, living the Christian life and believing the message of Jesus and centering their life around Jesus is kind of a foreign idea to them. And so they would rather just kind of stand at the edge and, you know, live their life and identify as someone who identifies with Jesus. Um, you could kind of say they were like that. And so she, as a, as a people, the Samaritans, they, they had a grid that one day there was going to be one guy who comes that was going to offer, and this is Jeremiah chapter 2, offer the nations of the world living water. And he was going to be the Christ. He was going to be the Messiah. He was going to be the savior of the world. He was going to unite the nations and he was going to rid the world of evil um, and, and rule as a good king. This was, this was the, the worldview of many people in, in the Holy Land. And so she sort of expected this. And here's this guy that, that shows up at the well and he basically says, look, I'm he. I'm the one that you are looking for. I'm the one that actually has the living water. So here she, Jesus reorients her life away from the falsehoods and the idols and the immorality that is possible. Um, and he turns basically an extreme outsider into one through whom other people begin to experience the goodness of Jesus. He takes one whose life is nothing but a, a, a message of shambles and reorients it into a messenger of the good news. It's the, the coalescence of all of these different dynamics all coming together and then a life, a life becomes the message. The life becomes the logos. And wherever the life goes, the message of the kingdom goes with it. This is what you need to know about your life is that as you are going, the message of Jesus that lives inside of you, that is the, the source of your living water, the eternal life that John is writing about, it goes with you wherever you go. You are the, the, the vessel. And I love that, that John really includes this, that um, it says in, in our text, let's go to this. After this exchange, it says, Verse 28, so the woman left her water jar and went away into the town. That's sort of like, you know, if you're reading the, the narrative, sometimes when you read the gospels, you kind of pick up on like, why did he put that in there? Does that matter? What she did with her water jar? Yes, it absolutely does matter what she did with her water jar because what she is doing is exactly what Jesus is saying, that if you desire to save your life, guess what? You're not going to keep it. But if you desire to lose your life, then that's where you truly will live. The water jar is absolutely important because it is, it's why she came to the well. It was, it was it's a, a temporal thing. It was the, the source of her life. And by her leaving it behind signifies, you know what? The source of her life is nothing in this world, but actually everything out of this world. 
The source, the source of, of our life is nothing that we can find in this world, but everything that comes from heaven above. That's the source of our life. And there are many people that are just trying to still drink the water of the world rather than drink the water of God and have the heavenly fountain flow from within. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Let's just stop there. This, uh, the gospel of John, if you've been around church a long time or any span of time, um, the gospel of John has a number of very unique phrases. Uh, most people center in on like the seven I am statements of Jesus. You know, throughout the gospel, there are you know, seven statements. I am this, I am the bread of life, I am the, the, uh, the living water, uh, I am the light of the world. There's, there's several s- statements that he makes. It really points to his divinity. Um, John couples the, the statements about Jesus' divinity or his confession of Christ or he, you know, his Christology, he partners with Jesus' divinity through seven signs. And so most often when people are reading the Gospel of John, they're, they're honing in on these phrases that repeat themselves. An often overlooked phrase that repeats itself through the Gospel of John is come and see. Right after the, the introduction, at the end of chapter one, there's, Jesus is, is going about, it says, John the Baptist And two of his disciples were standing by the side of the road. And John goes, behold, the Lamb of God. And instantly, I bet John was, I don't know, that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Like Immediately, two of John's disciples, so Jesus passes by, John goes, behold, the Lamb of God. And two of his disciples just take off. Hope he didn't suffer rejection. So they take off. And Jesus is walking down the road and they ask him, hey, Jesus. And Jesus sort of turns around and says, Jesus turns around and says, why are you following me? And they go, where are you staying? And Jesus says, come and see. That's the first time. A couple of verses later, so those two guys become his disciples. One of them is Andrew, who's the brother of Simon Peter. Um, it says instantly, Simon, Peter, Andrew goes and gets his brother. So he comes and sees what Jesus is doing and, and staying and saying. And then he goes, gets his brother, and he says, hey, come and see. I found this guy who might just be the Messiah. Come and see. And then... There's, is it Philip? Philip is one of the guys that comes and sees Jesus. And Philip goes to Nathaniel and says, hey, Nathaniel, I found this guy who I think is the Messiah. Come and see. And Nathaniel goes, where's he from? He goes, Nazareth. Oh, he goes, can anything good come from Nazareth? That's Nathaniel's response. He's skeptical. He's, he's skeptic. He's a skeptic. Nothing good can come from there. And so um, he says, still come and see. And so he goes and he sees Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, follow me. And if you follow me, you come with me, you will see greater things. You will see, and he goes on to say, you will see the heavens open and angels ascending and descending upon um, the Son of Man. You see greater things. So there's this, and then it just continues, like over and over and over again. You see these, these come and see, come and drink, come and eat. Um, uh, in John chapter seven, he says, uh, come, yeah, come and drink, um, and you'll have fountains of living water flowing within you. In John chapter 11, it sort of is a reversal, like Jesus, you know, comes to, the, to Lazarus um, and approaches uh, you say he approaches the wreckage of this world and they invite Jesus, Jesus come, to the, come, to the, come to the mess that's happened and see, bring your presence. Into, anyway, often overlooked. But come and see, 
really, in an essence, is an invitation to hear and experience the good news of Jesus firsthand. This is what she's, when she goes out to her town, when she leaves her water jar behind and goes to her town, she says, hey, come and see and experience the good news of Jesus firsthand. Then it says in verse 30, they went out of the town. The people that she, and this is, this is the thing that, uh, side note, if you're, you're wondering, like, why, does, why, do, do, why do I have, I look for alternatives to the way that the woman at the well is traditionally seen. Um, First of all, one of the reasons is the text doesn't really say that she's an immoral person. It doesn't explicitly say. There's other points in, in the Gospels where specific sins are named. And this is one of those instances where the, the, the specific sin that gets cast upon her isn't necessarily named. So it's pretty ambiguous. Um, so the text doesn't say. But also, if... If you were the one wearing the scarlet letter, and if you've read the scarlet letter, you kind of understand this. Uh, the, the testimony of the one who is cast into shame and cast, and, and cast outside the community and pushed out like this woman would have been, she actually carries some sort, it seems like she carries some sort of clout in her community. People are willing to listen to her rather than just push her aside and say, you're crazy, lady. Like, you know, they don't do that. So she goes and she says, hey, come and see. And the, the community responds, okay, let's see what's happening here. And she goes out and they go out with her. So verse 39, if you jump down, because there's this exchange between Jesus and his disciples, like they're sort of mystified at what's going on here. Um, and Jesus is talking about a harvest. And he's about to show them a harvest. He goes, guys, look, there's gonna be a harvest here in this town. Let's not miss it by thinking about food. <laughs> and so all of these people are coming out and says, Verse 39, many, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the women's testimony. He told me everything that I ever did. Now that's the only thing it says about the woman, right? And it doesn't specifically say what it is that she did. But what it's pointing to is the fact that, that Jesus was understood to be this, this coming prophet. And, and a, only a prophet could tell me, tell me something about my life that nobody else knows. So he's the one. He's, like, he's, there's, he's saying, look, her testimony of that Jesus is, is talking to me about, and I, I, I'm guessing that there's a whole lot more to the conversation that we don't know of. And so she goes, look, he, this is a guy that is, is using a prophetic gifting for um, for. My, for for me and for us, and he's talking about this living water and that we can drink from this living water. And so uh, her testimony of, of her encounter with Jesus becomes the catalyst for the community coming to Christ, which speaks to the, the power of a simple invitation to come and see. A simple invitation really is... Uh, to experience the good news of Jesus, it produces radical outcomes. With, with your life, get this, there's a lot of different expressions on like how you, this come and see dynamic sort of rolls out. Actually, I consider it like a, a, a pretty broad spectrum. Um, on one side, you know, the, the, of the spectrum, let's just say the very mild side of the spectrum, come and see is actually just like inviting per, a person to a church or a gathering. It's very low risk. It's like, I mean, it's like inviting somebody to a party, right? 
If you're part of a gathering, you know, you're it's kind of like a party, right? And so inviting a friend to come and see this Jesus community is very low risk. You can even attach like a steak dinner. Hey, if you come to, um, I heard people doing this before, like uh, I thought, man, I should have figured out how to do that. They say, if you come to church with me, I'll take you out for a steak dinner. I've heard people using that, that type of invitation. Um, I thought, man, I didn't know that was an option. As a, as a kid, I didn't have any options. It was get in the car, you're going with us. <laughs> so there's like a, there's a low risk side, but then like if you look at the book of Acts, there's, you know, take Philip, for example. Philip, Philip goes out into the public square and begins preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. He is telling the story to the masses of who Jesus is to the world and he's healing people and he's doing signs and wonders and there's all these things going on. And that, right, that represents the spectrum, right? Inviting a friend to church or a gathering, going, to the, going out to the community and going, hey, I've got, I've got the microphone, I've got the bullhorn, you know? Don't be the bullhorn person, like, if you ever spent time on Wright State's campus, you know the bullhorn guy. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not the good news. That's the bad news. Anyway, um, you get into that, and I'm not going to for the sake of time. Never underestimate the power of your own personal testimony with Jesus. Never underestimate the power of your own personal testimony with Jesus, the, the encounter that you've had with Christ. And some of you, many of you, probably have many testimonies. I, I, have, I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of testimonies of things that I've seen Jesus do in my life and in the lives of other people. I, I spend hours talking about it. You can't underestimate the power of one of those testimonies as an invitation for other people to experience and encounter Christ through your life. The, the simple act of, of saying, and this is, this is what Paul in, in Acts, uh, I think 19, he basically summarizes his story into um, a couple sentences. He says, I was basically, I was the chief of sinners. I was, I was the one persecuting the church and killing these Christians. And then I encountered Jesus and now I will do anything for him. That represents, that, that, those two sentences represent a radical change in a person's life. It's a radical shift in the trajectory. They were heading this way and boom, the gospel hits them. Jesus, they encounter Christ and boom, it knocks them back the other way. Never underestimate the power of you just telling somebody, yeah, before I knew Christ, my life was in shambles. I was searching for meaning and purpose in this world through a hundred different ways. And then I found Jesus and suddenly, suddenly I had this warmth in my soul that didn't exist before. Suddenly the loneliness that I felt all my life went away because the dry and the weariness of my life and the searching out of anything to satisfy that thirst, nothing in this world satisfies. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden it was it was like rain from heaven and waters from the beneath welled up in my life and changed my heart. That's a testimony. That's what Christ has done for each and every one of us. Never underestimate that. See, when we think about sharing the gospel with our lives, what we, we sort of you know, think about that, like what we see in Acts, like, oh, we gotta do that. 
or I gotta become an expert, right, in, in biblical studies. I need to know exactly the, the, the gospel message through and through, and I, I gotta be able to quote every verse and every passage just right, or else, you know, people just aren't gonna get it, or I'm gonna be a failure. So we think we're not adequate enough to be able to do that, or maybe even we think our our personality is not really suited for that. Like, oh, stand up in front of a crowd or even you know, talk to a group of people about what Jesus has done for my life. Yeah, that's more like an extroverted thing. That's, you know, that's for you know, professional Christians and I'm not one of those. So we, we, we sort of sideline, you know, be, based on our own timidity, we sort of sideline any any function of sharing the message with Jesus. And that's really comes down to the sharing and the preaching of the gospel is, is that is, that is all of that stuff is, is very ancillary to what, what actually happens six days a week. Because six days a week, we're all out in the world we're out in the world, we're interacting with, with other people who some, they know Jesus, others, they need to know Jesus. There's a world out there that's dying to know Jesus. And, and unless, unless someone shares the gospel with them or shares the, the, the simple invitation of come and see what Jesus has done for me, they'll never hear. And your life, again, your life is the logos. It's the speech of what God has done for you to the world. It's the message. You are the messenger. What am I doing? Okay. I, you know, I was in a, I was in a restaurant the other day. Um, I'll tell you a story. Um, I was meeting with another pastor from Cincinnati and uh, our server's there, you know, coming and going and going and going. And as she's coming and going, I like, I keep having this kind of recurring thought um, that uh, every time she shows up, I have this thought about restoration and like there's something that's, that's being restored to her and God's hands on her life. And so I'm just like developing this like thing, like, Lord, I think this is you. And uh, she walks up and before um, I, uh, uh, we got up and left, I, I just looked at her and said, hey, um, I'm, a, I'm a pastor and I like to pray for people. I just kind of like outed it. I'm like, I'm a pastor, which, you know, Sometimes it can get some really bad responses, but um, sometimes people have pity on me, like, oh, that's so sweet. And, you know, and she had pity on me. I said, hey, is, um, I just, as you were coming and going, I just kind of sometimes God speaks to me. Um, and uh, I just, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Is there something that, like, right now, like, you're on the edge of, uh, of a being, of, like, of a restoration? Maybe it's a relationship or... Um, there's something that has been lost to you that you're beginning to rediscover. And um, she starts, she looks at me, she goes, how'd you know that? I said, well, sometimes God speaks to me and, you know, um, it's just kind of the way it works. <laughs> and, and she goes, um, she starts crying. She goes, my, my ex-husband and I just bought a house and we're gonna give it another try. Wow. I said, how long have you guys been separated and divorced? And she goes, we've been separated and divorced for seven years. And um, she starts telling me the story. And I said, well, I, I don't know about you, but you know, kind of my impression is that like God's in the thing, um, that he's bringing you back together and it's okay. And I asked if I could pray for her. And I, I just took her by the hand and I said, and I, I asked, I said, can I hold your hand? I'd like to pray for you. And I said, Lord, I bless what you're doing. I bless in the name of Jesus what you're doing in her life, how you're restoring. And I, I, I just, I, I pray for her. She just was bawling. 
That's, that's another way that the message, the come and see, the encounter that I've had, the experience that I've had with Jesus actually gets out into the world. And you know what's great is the Holy Spirit anoints us for that type of ministry. He anoints the body of Christ to go and do that. Now that might be like kind of extreme for you. Like I could never do that. And I just go, look, if I can do it, you can do it, okay? Like seriously, I'm convinced that they can train monkeys to do pastor's jobs. Um, It's not that hard. It's hard if you're trying to do it on your own, but when you learn to rely on the, the presence and the, the power of the Holy Spirit to, do, to minister in that, that fashion, like, it's easy. It's really easy. Um, it really is so easy. A monkey could do it. Uh, if that's sort of, but it, let's just talk about extremes. Like if that's ex, in a, kind of an extreme example, like, oh, I just like I'm not there yet. Um, let me ask you this. Could you buy somebody a coffee? Can you buy a coffee? Hey, have you ever, I, I, sometimes I do this. I, I have post-it notes in my car and I'll write a, I'll write a message. I'll say, hey, um, we, used to ha- we used to have cards that said this, like, hey, uh, uh, just showing you God's love in a practical way. Have a coffee on me. God bless you. Uh, we, had, we had cards that said that and it, on the back of it had our church information and people took these cards and they started, they started handing them out and say, oh, the vineyard's gonna pay for the coffee. Like, well, no. Like, yes, yes, that's, I wish we had that superpower that we could like, you know, like, you know, you wanted to buy somebody a coffee in the name of Jesus. Like, I wish we could figure out how to make that work, but that doesn't work that way. Um, so we got rid of the cards and just, so I, I started writing post-it notes. I just said, hey, just um, want to encourage you today. Uh, Jesus loves you. God bless you. Enjoy the coffee. And I write that on a little post-it note and I tell the barista, hey, I want to I wanna, I wanna pay for the coffee of the person behind me. Is that okay? And th- this is at the drive-thru. And they go, oh yeah, sure. Like, would you, when they pull up, would you give them this, this little sticky note? And so I pay for their coffee. I get my coffee and I drive off. And that's, like, you can do that. Like, it's, that's, you know, Mother Teresa said, small things done with great love change the world. That is, that is a very small, simple act of kindness that, that, that can leave a lasting impact on a person's life and definitely change the course of their day. There's, there's times where I, I've actually known people, I've always prayed for this to happen, but it hasn't happened. Um, the... Uh, I know people who've been in a grocery store and they see a single mom who her, uh, her credit card or debit card gets declined and she can't pay for her groceries. And she's witnessing the, the panic. And so that person just sort of steps over and says, hey, I'll pay for it. I'll pay the price, whatever the cost. And they stick out their card and they swipe it. And the person says, why would you do that for me? And they go, I just want to show you God's love in a practical way. Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He gave his life for you. And that's, that's the gospel. You, you can do that, right? If you're feeling really bold and saying, you know what? I'm going to leave my jar behind. I'm going to give everything up. And I don't care how, because this is, this is what prevents people from doing this stuff. Is like, what if I look stupid? I used to ask myself that question. Like, oh man, I don't want to look stupid. Like they're going to like, and then <laughs> I just realized one day like, so what? What if I look stupid? What if they, th- they call me, man, you're just an idiot. Like, oh, you're one of those. And I've, you know, had that before. Like, oh, you people are just, you Christians, just all trying to spread good cheer throughout the world. Like, like, just, is, that, is that a bad thing? Like, I go, why is that a bad thing? <laughs> but well, once you decide, you know what? You know, living for Jesus really is like becoming, becoming foolish. It could be like the most foolish thing you do, but man, it is the most 
rewarding and life-giving. That's where the, 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 the living water just begins to gush out of us when we decide, you know what? I'm going to leave my jar behind and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna feed myself from the source that God's given me. I don't care what the, what the world thinks. I'm just gonna do this. And when you begin to live that way, you just, you, you become radical. You become like, I mean, this is how the, the, the first century, so there's 120 people after the, res, after the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, there's about 120 people in a room. These were all that were left of Jesus' followers. 120 people have today resulted in a global movement of almost 3 billion people. Get that. That it is, is not, it's not through complacency and it's not through apathy and it's not just through, oh, I'm gonna go to church on Sunday and that's gonna be my thing. It is actually when people decide that, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live for Christ. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to follow in his footsteps. I'm gonna treat people like Jesus treats people. I'm gonna do the stuff that he did. That's how, that's how Christianity takes off. People say, oh, I want to see a, I would love to see a revival in this, in this country. Anybody want to see a revival in this country? Go be a revival. Go be it. You see a revival. You'll see a revival when you begin living as the message, the come and see message. Look at my life. Experience Jesus through me. That's when people, that's when revivals begin to happen. That people take, when people take Jesus at his word and say, you know what, I'm just going to do this. Lives get changed. Cities get changed. The Samaritan town was changed. Jesus stayed there for two days. And they were changed. Okay, all right, let's stand. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to stretch you today, though, just so you know. If I haven't stretched you already, I was. Um, I tell you one last story. Now, I was at a. I, we were handing out waters, um, cold bottles of water, one Fourth of July downtown. Um, it was before the vendors in the, the the downtown thing got mad at us and booted us out because um, we we're giving away free water and they were trying to sell water anyway. Uh, I walked up to this guy, and uh, he was clearly an outsider. And the reason I would say that is because, man, like, um, he had, he had, you know, swastikas and KKK and hate slurs tattooed all over his body. I walked up to him and I said, "Hey, are you are you thirsty?" And he goes, "Yeah, actually, I'm kind of thirsty." And he kind of had this little like ashen look on his face like what are you doing talking to me and um and he goes why would you give me a bottle of water and I said well I just want to let you know that God loves you and he gave his life for you and uh, I just I'm curious if there's anything that um while I'm here if there's anything that I could pray for and he goes why would God want to touch me and I said, well, he loves you. Of course he'd touch you. There's nobody he wouldn't touch. And he goes, I don't know what to pray for. And I said, well, let me ask you this. If Jesus were standing here, what would you, what would you ask him for? And he, he told me, he goes, a new heart. I said, oh, okay. And I actually, the interesting thing is, I thought he was talking very metaphorical, like, oh, yeah. like, And... Um, I said, well, let's pray for that. I'm like, oh, this is great. This guy wants to be, he wants to be saved. He wants a new heart. This is why Jesus, they give us a heart, take our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Uh, like, this is great. This guy's going to get into the gospel. And so I just prayed, um, Lord, would you give him a new heart? Would you, would you transform his heart of stone into a heart of flesh and transform him by your love? And... Uh, said, amen. And he's crying. Something's happening. And uh, I, I walk away and just, hey man, God loves you. Talk to you later. There's a church over here that you could go to. Um, comes, come about 15 minutes later, the, 
the EMT, the Dayton EMT comes up to me and says, hey, what'd you say to that guy over there? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I was like, I just told him about God's love and prayed for him and gave him some water. And he goes, let me tell you something interesting that happened. He goes, we checked that guy. I guess his pulse was 155. We're about to take him to the, to the emergency room. He's having a heart attack. It's a cardiac event. And we went back a few minutes later and checked on him after you talked to him and his pulse was 70. So what did you do? <laughs> I said, if suddenly it became clear, like, oh, he was asking for a new heart because he needed a new heart. Point is, you just never know what God's gonna do with your life. The only thing that we can do is just be obedient and be committed to being the message, right? So, um, now I'm gonna stretch you. All right, uh, before I close in prayer, I want you to turn to your neighbor. I'm gonna, we're just gonna, we're gonna practice, all right? Can we practice? I'm gonna teach you how to pray for somebody. Is that okay? Uh, turn to a neighbor and just ask him this question. This is, how, this is how you started. Like if you think, man, I should pray for this person before I leave. Just ask him this very simple question. How can I pray for you? Okay, so do it. Turn to your neighbor and just say, just ask, how can I pray for you? And please don't give a story. We don't have time for stories. And you know, you can provide context after service. Okay. That should take all about five seconds or 10 seconds to do, all right? So now that you know what to pray for, you ask the person, hey, can I, can I hold your hand? So ask them, <laughs> guys are. Ask them if you hold their hand and then just pray. Say, in the name of Jesus, I ask Lord, that you would move in this person's life in the way that they need you to move. That's all you do. And if you're, you're thinking, I cannot pray for anybody, like that's just like so outside my wheelhouse. One of the easiest prayers to pray is, oh God, oh God, oh God. Sometimes the, sometimes the, the, uh, the thing that the person needs, <laughs> that's the prayer they need. It's just, oh God, oh God, oh God. Okay. You see? And amen. You bless them. Another prayer is, Jesus, bless this person. I bless this person. When you bless a person, what you do is you, you give them the presence of God. I bless, I bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, now. Next week, the person that you prayed for, it is your responsibility to seek them out and ask what God did for them this week. I, I have time after time after time prayed with people in convenience stores and restaurants and gas stations and doctor's offices and the orthodontist and the orthodontic office the other day or the, the dentist chair and I prayed for my uh, my hygienist <laughs> to find that word I prayed for her I pray for her often and regularly and you know what she sits there every once in a while and tells me hey you prayed for that thing and God started doing this or I've started seeing this result it's interesting that when we pray for stuff, things happen. Might be a coincidence, but I, I've prayed enough times to find that it's rarely a coincidence, it's usually God. So seek them out next week, ask them, hey, what did God do in your life? And then all of a sudden, guess what you have? You have a testimony. You have something that you have witnessed God do that you can tell other people, hey, come and see. All right? Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask, Lord, that um, as, as you have anointed me and many others in this room to go and to, to share the gospel and to 
heal the sick, to proclaim the good news and also demonstrate the good news. That, Lord, you would, you would uh, anoint each and every person in this room to be a carrier of the good news, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a witness for Jesus Christ in the world. Help us, Lord, to, to see the, the value of every great and small thing that you've done for us because all of it, all of it is an invitation for others to experience you. So Lord, would you send us this week into the darkest places? Would you send us this week to the people who are hopeless? Would you send us to the lonely? Would you send us to the hurting and the broken and those who are in need of healing? Anoint us, anoint our hands, Lord, for healing. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for what you're gonna do for our, through our lives this week. It's all yours, Jesus, it's your testimony. It is the testimony of Jesus. We bless you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this week.